This is the second part of testing and cultivation of enteric bacteria lecture. We're going to start out by talking about some of the biochemical test reactions. Now in the laboratory you can do your biochemical test reactions either manually like we saw in the previous lecture where there's an individual tube for each test and you can set up all of these different tubes and that is actually the way we used to do microbiology many many years ago. Every single test was set up manually and you had tons of plates and tubes for each patient specimen. Then it moved to a more commercial way to do these tests where you have these little kits. And these kits are very nice because you do the same tests but you do multiple tests in one reaction. So some of the common commercial kits are what's called an enterotube and this has different test media in compartments and it looks like a big huge pen. What's more commonly used and still used in a clinical laboratory is the API. And the API has media in these little small cups or couplets and you inoculate with a suspension of your pure culture one organism and you incubate it and then you can look at many different test reactions. So we'll show these. Here's the entero tube. See it looks like a big pen. You take off both um, caps on it. You just touch the end of the tip. It's a little metal tip to your organism. You pull this metal rod that's going through all those different media right through and then you put it back in halfway, break off the end of the metal um, tube, put your cap back on, put it in the incubator and after an overnight incubation you come back and you read each one of these different media test reactions and it'll give you a number and you put the number in this little book and then you look up that number and it'll tell you what organism those test reactions correspond to very similar to what the instruments are doing. So with the instruments you don't have to do as much manual. You don't have to manually read these tests anymore. But again, if the instruments go out, you have to do some of these tests. So here we have the entero tube and you can see some of the tests that are done, you know, glucose fermentation, your hydrogen sulfide um, production, indole, all different types of carbohydrate fermentation, lactose, arabinose, sorbitol, the vogue's proskauer test, the urea, the PDA, the citrate. So these um, commercial kits are doing all these different test reactions in one single tube. Now what's more commonly used in the clinical lab than the entero tube is what's called an API test strip. So you can do the API for your Enterobacteriaceae family members and there's a different API test strip for your non-fermenting gram-negative rods. So these are little couplets that have media in them. You inoculate in each couplet a suspension of your bacterial organism. You incubate. Some of these you overlay with oil. Uh, mineral oil to block out any oxygen from getting in. You incubate them in the incubator, come back and you manually read each one of these couplets and again you write down the reactions in this book, it converts it to a number and again the number corresponds to an organism. But you as the scientists need to, to know when there's a test that doesn't make sense. Well gee, Pseudomonas doesn't normally ferment that sugar, why is that couplet yellow? Something's wrong. I need to repeat this test because it's not coming out right. An, ex an example of an a of API, I was working in a clinical microbiology laboratory and we had a five-year-old patient diarrhea s uh, specimen and when we inoculated it onto blood agar, it had a very characteristic look of Shigella. 
because Shigella has a very characteristic, what's called a skirting morphology. So we were sure that this was going to be a, a Shigella. Well, this wasn't that long ago, so we didn't have to do any manual tests. We made a suspension of the, of the organism, and we put it into the microscan. That's the piece of equipment that that lab had. When that uh, sample came out of the um, microscan, it did not say that it was Shigella. It's, I believe it said that it was Enterobacter. It's either Enterobacter or E. coli. And so we were like, wait a minute, that, that just it doesn't make sense. The, you know, diarrhea, five-year-old boy, um, you know, daycare, um, skirting organism. This is Shigella. Put it back, repeated it, put it back into the machine, and came out again with the wrong organism. So we went and got an API strip, and we inoculated the API strip, and sure enough, the API strip showed that it was Shigella. So every now and again, you do have to do some confirmatory tests in the clinical laboratory, and that is what makes you scientists, technologists. You need to know when there's an issue. You need to know when something needs to be repeated, and you need to know when you have to go back and do a more manual test like an API because something is not working out right. You can also do antigenic testing in the micro laboratory. You could do serological testing to look for surface antigens. These are usually agglutination types of reactions. You can do slide agglutinations using anti-sera. You can identify the O, the H, and the K antigens on the, on the surface. You can do a Weedall test, which detects serum agglutinins to the Salmonella O and H antigens. Um, so there's all sorts of agglutination tests that can be done, which allow you to confirm that, yes, this patient does, it does have a salmonella. Other testing methods that are done, um, the, molec the microbiology laboratory, a lot of micro laboratories have moved to molecular based testing. Micro and cytology are two of the labs that in a lot of um, diagnostic laboratories have a molecular laboratory within them. So there are DNA studies, you can do amplification studies, a lot of MRSA testing in some laboratories are done using RT-PCR, there's probe testing, a lot of mycobacterium is, is tested using probes, you can possibly do pulse field gel electrophoresis if you're working in a specialty laboratory or a public health microbiology laboratory where you're going to do strain typing. So just keep in mind that there are other testing methods available and there will be, I think, more and more of our micro tests will be moving in the molecular direction. Now, our laboratory media. Media is incredibly important in the micro laboratory because even though all of the laboratories have become very automated, you still have to take your patient specimen, whether it's a fecal specimen, a urine specimen, a wound specimen, and inoculate it onto laboratory media and grow up your organism. So in general, the three most common lab media used in the microbiology laboratory are going to be your 5% sheep blood agar. And these are usually um, shortened as SBA for sheep blood agar or BAP for a blood agar plate. Another is your chocolate agar, and the third is McConkey agar. Now depending on what lab you're working in, when you get a specific specimen, like you, if you get a fecal specimen, they may one laboratory may always use sheep blood agar, McConkey agar, and another agar, like XLD agar. Another lab may use a, another set of agar. Sheep blood agar is one that regardless of the specimen, sheep blood agar is always used plus other agars. If it's a respiratory specimen, 
chocolate agar and sheep blood agar are used because you don't want to miss some of those fastidious organisms like your Haemophilus influenza organisms. For fecal specimens, you're usually always going to do sheep blood agar and a McConkie agar plate, as well as possibly some other more selective and differential media. Your more selective media that are commonly used for enteric specimens, there's a media called hectoin enteric or HE agar. There's xylene, xylose lysine deoxycholate or XLD, salmonella shigella agar or SS agar, CIN agar, which is cephalidin ergosin novobiosin and then McConkie sorbitol, which we already mentioned in our E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli lecture. So 5% sheep blood agar. You all should already be very familiar with this agar. We've talked about it with practically every lecture we've had. It is tryptocase soy agar. It is used for almost every single solitary specimen in the clinical microbiology laboratory because it will cultivate most bacteria except for the highly fastidious organisms that we've already discussed. The nice thing, as you already know about your sheep blood agar, is you can see hemolysis on it. So benefits of blood agar, it allows you to grow most bacteria. It can allow you to evaluate sometimes the how much is of a, an organism is present, and it allows for your biochemical test reactions. So here's a, a very important fact in the clinical laboratory. You always want to do your biochemical test reactions, whether it's oxidase, indole, citrate, it doesn't matter. You want to do your biochemical testing off of a 5% sheet blood agar plate. You don't want to use your selective media to do biochemical tests. And the reason is the selective media contains pH indicators and chemicals in it. And some of those chemicals in the selective media might react with your biochemical tests and give you a false positive or a false negative reaction. Blood agar is just a nice uh, nutrient media, very rich media that doesn't have any chemicals in it. So it's not going to give you any false positive or negative reactions with most of your biochemical testing. Your enrichment media. Enrichment media is sometimes used to enhance the recovery of pathogens, especially in an enteric specimen because you have a lot of normal flora there. So what you want to do is enhance your pathogen and inhibit the growth of your normal flora so that you can find your pathogen. So some of these enrichment medias would be GN broth or gram-negative broth and selenite F broth. So what you would do is you would take your specimen, you would put it in one of these enrichment medias, you would incubate it for about six to eight hours, then you're going to take some of that broth and put a couple of drops on some selective media and streak your um, the broth out for isolation and hopefully in that six to eight hour incubation period you have encouraged your pathogen to grow. Selenite broth is one of these enrichment broths that will allow salmonella species to grow. It's a peptone based broth that contains sodium selenite. Sodium selenite is toxic to a lot of the Enterobacteriaceae family members that are going to be normal flora in a fecal or stool specimen. So this will allow growth of salmonella, which might be the pathogen that you're, that you're looking for, and kill off some of the normal flora. Thioglycolate broth is a general nutrient broth. 
the nice thing about thioglycolate broth and thioglycolate broth is used in a lot of clinical laboratories along with your sheep blood agar is it will support the growth of many many different types of organisms it will allow anaerobes to grow aerobes to grow microaerophilic organisms and it's a soy broth that contains glucose as well as a pancreatic digest of casein so you have thioglycolate broth is mixed with a with a small amount of agar so thioglycolate is a broth it's not an agar but it has a tiny bit of agar in it and it allows the bottom of the tube to have a lower oxygen level so that anaerobes will grow so that small amount of agar reduces that redox potential so here are some tubes that are inoculated with, uh, that are some organisms that are inoculated in thioglycolate broth. So an anaerobe will grow at the very, very, very bottom of the tube. An strict aerobe will grow only at the very top of the tube. A facultative organism will grow throughout the entire tube because facultative organisms can grow in the presence or absence of oxygen. Microaerophilic organisms will grow underneath the surface, so towards the top, but not right at the top of thioglycolate broth. Another type of selective and differential media, so thioglycolate broth is not necessarily selective or differential. It doesn't have any chemicals in it to allow one organism to grow and not others. But our selective and differential media, one is EMB, or eosinmethylene blue. This is used in some labs to isolate your enteric bacilli, and it'll differentiate lactose and non-lactose fermenters. It's a peptone base that contains lactose and sucrose. It also has eosin and methylene blue as indicators. So when you get fermentation, you get a drop in pH and then your indicators are in this media to make color changes. So a lactose fermenter on EMB agar will turn um, kind of a pink purple color. So EMB agar tends is is a kind of a, a reddish orangey color, and you will get different reactions. So like I said, lactose fermentation will be kind of a purpley color, pink to purple color. You can have non-lactose fermenters that will not change a color. You'll have other organisms that will make a metallic sheen using this agar. So it is a nice differential media that some labs use and some labs do not use it. McConkey agar, almost every lab uses McConkey. So you are going to uh, inoculate a lot of sheep blood agar and a lot of McConkey agar. McConkey again is selective and differential. And you guys remember when I'm talking about media, you should go back to the very beginning of that first lecture notes where I have that huge table of media. And every time we talk about a media, you should go back there and highlight it and memorize what's on there because you will get media questions on your exams, including the final exam. You need to know if they're selective or differential. You should know what's, you know, sort of what's in them, not every single ingredient, but kind of the general ingredients that allow it to work the way it does. So McConkey agar is a peptone base. It has lactose, so it allows you to see lactose fermentation. It has neutral red as a pH indicator. Organisms that will ferment lactose will drop the pH and you'll get a color reaction. McConkey agar is selective because it contains bile salts and crystal violet, which will inhibit your gram-positive bacteria. So McConkey agar only allows the growth of gram-negative bacteria, and it allows you to see lactose fermenters, which makes it selective and differential. So McConkey agar, your organisms, it's kind of a pink color. Your organisms are going to not change any color if they're not lactose fermenters. They're going to be kind of a creamy looking. 
if they are lactose fermenters, they are going to turn a bright pink color on Makanki agar. Now we have another type of Makanki, and that is Makanki with sorbitol. Again, it's selective and differential. It only allows gram-negative organisms to grow, like Makanki agar. The difference is, instead of having lactose as the carbohydrate source, it has sorbitol as the carbohydrate. And this media is going to allow you to identify your enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157H7. So regular E. coli can ferment sorbitol and E. coli 0157H7 cannot. And so that's one reason why sorbitol macanchi agar would be used in a clinical laboratory. Another commonly used um, agar, so most stool specimens are going to be inoculated onto sheep blood agar, Maconchi agar, and usually at least one other highly selective media. Hectoin enteric agar might be one, or XLD might be another. So hectoin enteric, or HE agar, is both differential and selective. It allows you to isolate salmonella and shigella from all of your other enteric organisms that would be in a fecal specimen. It's a peptone-based agar. It contains bile salts to inhibit gram-positive organisms. It contains the carbohydrates lactose and sucrose, so it'll allow you to see lactose or sucrose fermentation. It contains ferric ammonium citrate. That allows you to see hydrogen sulfide production. So like TSIA, slants, hectoin enteric will allow you to see lactose and sucrose fermentation as well as hydrogen sulfide production. It has two different indicators, pH indicators in it, bromothymol blue and acid fusion to give a color change when the pH drops. So hectoin enteric agar is a green, a nice bright dark green agar. And organisms that will ferment lactose or sucrose will turn a bright yellow on HE agar. Organisms that do not ferment sucrose will not change a color on this agar. They'll kind of look green, the color of the media. If an organism is a hydrogen sulfide production producer, you'll have a black spot on that organism. SS agar is selective for salmonella and shigella. It is a peptone base with lactose. It has ferric citrate to see hydrogen sulfide production and sodium citrate. It has a neutral red pH indicator and it inhibits your coliform bacteria, your normal intestinal flora, that's what your coliforms are, using brilliant green and bile salts. So on SS agar, your salmonella, which is a hydrogen sulfide producer, will be a black colored colony or a black center uh, of your colony. CIN, or Cephsolidin ergosin novobicin agar, is very specifically used if you think there's a Yersinia species. So it is selective for Yersinia. However, Aramonis will grow on this agar. It's a peptide base with yeast extract. Mannitol is the carbohydrate and bile salts as a selective chemical. And it has neutral red and crystal violet in it. XLD or xylose lysine deoxycarb deoxycholate is both selective and differential. It allows you to isolate salmonella and shigella from other gram-negative rods. It contains a yeast extract with lysine, xylose, lactose, and sucrose, so you can see lactose and sucrose fermenters. You can also see hydrogen sulfide production because it contains ferric ammonium citrate. It has sodium deoxycholite, which inhibits gram-positive bacteria, and it has a pH indicator called phenol red. 
So in XLD, it's a red media. If the organism has black centers or the whole colony on the plate is black, it would be a hydrogen sulfide produ producer like a salmonella. If the organism turns the media from a pink color to a bright yellow color, it means it ferments either lactose and or sucrose. Now there's another newer media. It's been around for a while. Um, when it first came out, a lot of clinical labs were not using it because it was very, very expensive. The cost of it has come down more recently, so more clinical labs have started using this agar. There's a lot of different types of chrome agar. So you can have chrome agar specifically for um, to see MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You can use chrome agar um, for your enteric organisms that are commonly a cause of urinary tract infections. So there's many different types of chrome agar and depending on what specimen you are inoculating in the clinical micro lab, you wanna make sure you have the right kind of chrome agar. So chrome agar is you know, just an agar plate, and depending on what specimen you have, it will turn different colors. So E. coli will be a pink color. Klebs yellow will be a very dark purplish blue. Proteus is kind of an orangey color. Enterococcus is a teal color. It'll, it'll also allow your Staphylococcus aureus, which is kind of a creamy white color, and Staphylococcus saprophyticus. So this particular plate would be what you would want to inoculate a urine specimen on so that you can see these are all your very common causes of urinary tract infections, E. coli being the most common, but then your Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus, Proteus, Klebsiella, all very common urinary tract infection organisms. Um, so these, these agars are very nice because you can inoculate a specimen onto it and all of the different colonies will be a different color depending on what it is. So if you had a feeling that this urine had a, they had a uropathogenic E. coli, you can go in and just pick up those pink colored colonies and then do some of your biochemical testing on it. So that's the end of our testing of the enteric organisms. You should be very comfortable with all of these tests. You should really understand triple sugar iron agar. I suggest you go read about it in the textbook. If this didn't make any sense to you, you can make an appointment to call me up. You should know all of your selective dif and differential media because there will be questions and the only way you're going to know if it's one organism or another organism are based on the test reactions that I give you in the question and that's how the board exams are worded as well so you really have to have a firm grasp of all of these different tests because as you know the Enterobacteriaceae as well as all of the other gram-negative rods the only way you can tell the difference from one to the other is biochemical tests. One gram negative rod looks like another gram negative rod. You cannot differentiate them as easily as your gram positive organisms. So I highly suggest that you look over the media table I gave you in the beginning and you really understand these reactions.